This week on Garden Time, we're talking about the birds and the bees. But don't get excited, we're talking about pollinators. Do you know the pollinators in your garden and what you can do to attract them? We have the buzz on pollinators next on Garden Time. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru in Salem, Oregon. Start your new Subaru story at Capital Subaru. We are like nothing else. From the moment you step through these doors, you see it, you feel it. We do things differently here. Our people, our culture, our customer experience. Tell us what you're looking for and we'll upgrade the way you shop for Subarus. When you're just browsing, need great service, or starting your next adventure, we're always here for you. It's your story at Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. Welcome to the Garden Time Podcast. We're based in the Pacific Northwest of the United States in a Zone 7 region. This deals with plants that can survive at approximately zero degrees Fahrenheit or warmer. I'm producer Jeff Gustin with your hosts, Judy Alaruzzo and Ryan Seeley. Welcome to Garden Time. Uh, we don't, as always, we'd like to welcome you and we'd like to thank Capital Subaru in Salem, Oregon for sponsoring us. And first off, we're going to be going back and we're going to be talking about our last show, our last <laughs> podcast, and we were talking about extremes. And today we are sitting inside in air conditioning. You'll hear it kicking on and off, but we are in the middle of a hundred degree stretch of weather for the next few days. And um, so what have you noticed in the garden center with people coming in? Oh, people are just so concerned about their plants because it's like it's so hot and it's been, you know, it hasn't been really cool, cool, but it hasn't been 100 degrees. So what can I do to keep my plants okay? Can I still plant in this hot weather? What can I do to keep them alive? And, you know, what, what you do is you just don't water, you know. Yeah. It, this is not the time to be so conservative. Don't water the sidewalk, right? but make sure you're watering your plants, watering your pots. You know, because they can't get that extra water. Yeah, people brought up the whole ice cube thing. Oh, and it's like, yeah, you know, really, no, it's it's it doesn't matter how much water gets. I mean, it's right. It, just water it good, right. let it soak through. Yeah. So. And yeah. my neighbor, she has like some hydrangeas that they get two hours of like afternoon intense sun. Yeah. So she put sheets over them yesterday, yeah. just because, just to kind of shade them. So if you have to put umbrellas up, you know, get your patio umbrella or create shade or yeah. get shade cloth or something. But I've noticed, you know, between the heat that we had earlier in the season and the heat that we have now, it's a little bit different. My hydrangeas are not wilting down nearly as much as they were earlier, because mm. that foliage is it's older ah. now and it's kind of hardened off. So the plant's a little bit more adaptable to, you know, the heat that we're having now. So nice. I'm not getting that wilt. But I do have, you know, we talked last time about, you know, I have everything on the sprinkler system mm -hmm. and drippers. But I'm still having to go around in the evenings and doing some touch-up watering, things that I know are seeing that are a little bit wilted, right. not getting the water just to kind of cool them down. Right. And it's getting out and looking at it. Oh, so. looking. It you know, I have a friend that has a new system, and so she's not really a gardener. She's learning. But she just thinks, I just flip that switch, it comes on, and I'm fine. It's like, you have to go out there and see what's going on. Right. You can't just trust it that it's getting to all the plants. Sometimes it gets skewed or sometimes it's stuck. So really go out there and, and really kind of notice things. Yeah. And it's, you know, we've, we've talked in the past on, you know, on the TV shows and before about, you know, now is a great time to go out and evaluate mm -hmm. your yard. I mean, if you're, you're starting yeah. to see, you know, with these heats that, you know, you're having the certain plants that are dying down and getting fried all the time, mm -hmm. well, maybe come this fall, maybe it's a good idea to move those around and kind of, you know, rearrange your furniture a little bit right. and, put, and put the plants that might take more sun that you're not having to be out there babying it so much. So, uh, so, you know, just go out, walk your garden, make sure that you're doing the right things, mm -hmm. and those plants are going to tell you what they need a lot of the time. So um, the other thing we're going to talk about, just real quickly, is uh, Garden Time, we always have um, almost like an annual tour. And the, the last couple of years, we've had the tour canceled because of COVID. And this year, we are going to Holland and Belgium, and we're going to go to the Floriad. Um, we still have a couple more seats available, and... If you can get into us by the end of August, go to gardentime.tv. Um, it'll we should have a great time. Oh, I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah, yeah, I'm really look, forward looking forward to. I mean, we're we're touring gardens, and mm -hmm. you know, we're going to Floriad, which is every ten years. I mean, it's the yeah. World Fair of Plants. Right. 
you know, the Osmere Flower Auction, you know, they're yeah, moving millions of, of plants and flowers through there every, every day, day. Right. which is, you know, to see these scales yeah. and, you know, visit these botanic gardens, it's a you know, pretty spectacular. Yeah, thing. and it's a direct flight on Delta um, to get there, so you don't have to worry about losing your luggage. Right. You get on the plane, your luggage will get on the plane, we're not making any plane changes. Right. Um, and so it, we're all looking forward to that, so if you are interested in it, uh, please go to gardentime.tv. Like I said, there's a little Garden Time Tours icon, and you can click on the little airplane and you can join us. So today, though, we're going to talk about something else that is also very, very popular, and that's pollinators. And, you know, the pollinators have come up and saved the bees. Everybody's concerned about the bees. But first of all, let's talk about what is a pollinator. So pollinators, I think everybody knows what a bee is, and that you know bees are so, so essential to um, our food source. And what was that statistic? We were reading earlier, one in every three bites of food that you take is affected by a pollinator. Right, and the majority of that is bees. So um, that's like the number one. Right. And then other ones are like butterflies, and we love butterflies in our garden. It's beautiful to have, you know, that we grow right. floating flowers, and they're just so pretty. Um, what are uh, hummingbirds to a, a you know a degree? Um, what else do we see? But you, you know, but you know, you go back to the bees. There are different types. Oh yeah, types so of many the bees, bees, right? right? You, know, you got your you know your honeybees <clears throat> and your mason bees and your bumblebees. Mm -hmm. You know, and very tons of other bees. And so many other private. native bees. Right. Right. But you're also, I actually found a list, and so oh, this yeah, is yeah. the bees of Oregon, mm -hmm. which is where uh, we are for the garden time. And there are over 500 different species of bees in Oregon. Right. And so um, I'll actually have a link to this list. And it lists a very a huge number of bees, including leafcutter bees, bumblebees, right. that kind of thing. So, it, and it's bees are everywhere. We, right. And not just the European honeybees, which were introduced here. There were native bees here before they were introduced. So. And those aren't even in hives. They're, I mean, they have colonies, sometimes they're solitary, like the mason, and they're in right. like little holes that they kind of find and kind of lay eggs and go back to. So some look like flies, you know, they're right. so small and they don't bother you. They don't have stingers. You don't have to be afraid of them. Um, I know people can get Cause nervous. I think a lot of times it. people kind of give bees a bad rap because they're so, so afraid that they're just automatically thinking that, oh, it's a bee, it's going to sting me. Right. You know, I'm deathly allergic. Yeah. Well, not all bees are like that. There are some that are like that, right. but it's, you know, understanding which types of bees that are that are around in your area. Right, right. And they're so busy. You know, you're out in your garden. They are so busy getting nectar, getting pollen that they don't even bother with us <laughs> when right. they're in there. They're just doing their job and doing their what they need to do. And a lot of times the pollination is passive. So they're mm -hmm. going for nectar and right. then they carry the pollen to the next, next plant. plant. Right. Right. To, and that's what creates the seeds, which creates more plants. Right. So um, we also were talking about there's also ants, mm -hmm. um, right. moths, slugs, and even bats. Right. So right. Um, it, depending on what you plant, you can attract or help some of those species thrive by what you plant in your garden. And we'll talk about that later. Yeah, and so. even like moths was another one you talk mm -hmm. about butterflies a lot, but you kind of forget about the right, moths, the moths right. and you talk about the bees, but you also forget about the wasps. Right. Right. We're all afraid of wasps, right? right? You know, they're trying to trap and get rid of them, but they're actually pollinating also. Yeah. And it's, I think that we need, we need to be sensitive to our environment. And so, we, you know, everybody has their job to do in the garden. And I think we have to pay attention to that. So that, that goes around to being, um, having, um, no pesticides. And also creating an environment, like you have that swaggy kind of area, you know, you don't clean everything and have it pristine. You even leave like a little dirt area for like that's, um, for butterflies need that, that kind of muddy area. You put out water, um, it, not just for the birds, but you know, everybody needs some water. And so you have to make sure that you have all of that so your environment, your garden is a welcoming to all kinds of nature. A couple of years, well, more than a couple of years ago, Judy remembers, we went out to Berry Botanic Garden, which was a very small conservatory species type garden and they left lots of areas in the garden wild mm -hmm. so when they prune right. trees they would just leave the branches on the ground and they had their you know public areas which were very clean and well manicured but they left a lot of the garden just wild right. and that helps those ground dwelling bees mm -hmm. and some of the other species that, uh, that do that so yeah there's even movements now you know no mow may Right. Kind of thing oh, yeah. where you, you know don't mow your lawn in May because it has so much of the native grasses that are coming up and blooming or some of the flowers in there that you know that time of year when you're getting a lot of the pollinators. Right. You know we we take for granted where we always want to have every weed and everything taken care of mowed down and manicured, but 
there's a lot of good that happens in in our lawn that you know we just kind of let it go for a little I bit. I even let my dandelions, I let them bloom and then I take them before they go to seed because you ever see so many bees on there and different kind of bees, I mean, it's amazing. And so there's a lot of nectar on there and so you just take them before they go to seed. So you're deadheading your dandelions. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Then I make it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that just promotes more bloom on your dandelions. Yeah, right, yeah. right. So. Um, and then when there are other places we talk about, you know, so people are concerned about where they get information. Most a lot of our information comes from uh, OS, the Oregon State Extension Service, mm -hmm. their website, and they have the Oregon Bee Project links to that on there, and, and they're just the Xerces Society, mm -hmm. which is all about insects. They have a tremendous website, which mm -hmm. is uh, covers a lot of that um, information about how to attract, what to uh, what pollinators are, what will attract them, what to plant, that kind of stuff. So. Um, is there been any other places that you've heard of or information that you've heard about pollinators that um, you would want to share with uh, well, listeners if, and viewers? Well, if you're going to be in London and you're going to be at Kew Garden, you have to see the bee, that bee exhibit they have. It's amazing. And you can actually listen to beehives and you can hear all of the, you know, the drones kind of buzzing around and it's fascinating. And I, I wonder the if you can go on the yeah, yeah, yeah. You can probably go on their website and get a link to that too. It's fascinating if anybody's going to be in London. Um, and but it was, I, yeah, it was fascinating because they linked lights on the, uh, on the installation with the activity in the beehives. So as the beehives got more active when the sun came mm -hmm. out, the lights were flashing more and yeah, it was cool. fascinating. Yeah, it, it was, was fascinating. Cool, cool. Yeah. Um, so, why should we care? And we talked about how important it is for pollination. Uh, you know, the, the amount of uh, what, one out of every three. Bites. Yeah, one, one, at one in three bites of food. Yeah. And so, you know, we rely on all of these plants and crops that we grow. You know, our everything. You know, corn and beans and right, you know right. our, our fruits and our vegetables mm -hmm. and our garden. You know, all of that is coming from a flower, which is then turning into a seed or whatever. Right. If that flower does not get pollinated, it's not turning into something. Right, right. You know, without being pollinated by a bee or a hummingbird or a, or a butterfly. Right. So it takes this massive ecosystem that we kind of take for granted and don't really see. You know, some of it is so small that we don't see this happening. Mm -hmm. We just assume that it just does its thing and we don't realize where it's coming from. Right. And so it's important to kind of look back and go, okay, so how does break this down? How does this actually play out and work where you actually, have, what is pollination happening? Right. And for Oregon, we had one of the wettest April, and we had even into May, and when the fruit trees were blooming, I think we're going to have a lot less fruit production yeah. because those, the bees can't be out when it's that wet. It was cool and it was wet, and it's like they couldn't do their job, and so there's less fruit. Uh, or else the fruit hasn't, you know, uh, matured enough. Right. So it's going to be interesting to see how the crops all come in. Yeah, you know, and there's, there's been you know a lot of breeding, in you know fruits and vegetables to make them more more productive or bigger yields on smaller plants and more disease resistance. But it still comes down unless it's getting pollinated. It really doesn't matter because you're not going to get it anyway. Right. And I think that's why people, especially if you're going to have fruit trees in your yard and you want that production, is to make sure that you're welcoming in the mason bees right. or the native bees because they work a lot cooler in earlier spring than the honeybees do. I can't remember now what the temperature is. I think the mason bees work like five degrees cooler, five to eight degrees cooler than a honeybee. So then you're gonna make sure that you're gonna have more pollination in your fruit trees than maybe your neighbor or whatever. So it's always nice to invite those native bees to come and work in your right. yard too. Yeah, you know, I was reading too on the Oregon State website, there are over 500 native varieties of bees in Oregon. Isn't that amazing? No, it's yeah. incredible. And you were yeah. talking we were talking about, you know, slugs and bats mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff and, and people are going, Slugs pollinate? And it's like, yeah, there was we we actually uh, visited growers that grow plants where the blooms are very close to the ground and the mm -hmm. slugs come in. What attracts a pollinator? I mean, because people go out and they'll buy the most colorful thing in the world, but that doesn't always necessarily mean that the pollinators will come to that colorful plant or flower. Oh, it's many different things. So like um, hummingbirds need that tubular flower. Right. And not just red. I mean, they, they always say red flowers, but I think they, they need that shape. 
so that they can get into it. Right, because you have you know you have a long a long beak, right, on, right, a, on right. a hummingbird. Right. And it's hard to pick that off off a flat flower. Right. So that's why they're looking for those tubular mm -hmm. things because they need they need the pollen that's in the inside is what right. gets on their little beak, and then they fly around to the next flower. And, but they're because they're going a lot of times after the nectar. Right. That is, that is in there. So they're not going after pollen. That's the, kind of the after one. Mm -hmm. So they're going in there to feed on the nectar. The pollen gets on them, and then they're taking that pollen to bring right. flower. Yeah. Well, everybody's saying you know colorful flowers, right. and just I was just thinking about bats. At night, there is no mm -hmm. color that you know they usually use scent and right, some other scent. different mm -hmm. um, indicators from the plant to come in. I mean, if you've been out and seen a night blooming plant, right at twilight, they get incredibly fragrant, and it's like they're sending out their signal. I'm here and I'm ready. You know, I've, I've got something for you to eat, plus some pollen for you to carry. Right, too, so. right. And like bumblebees, my favorite thing to do is watch a bumblebee work a foxglove. And they go in, you know, bumblebees are huge, and they go yeah. in those, each little floret, and they go in there to get the nectar, and they are just covered with pollen. So they're even more like fuzzier. Yeah. They're just so cute. Yeah. And somebody said too that bumblebees are good pollinators for certain plants because the, the vibration of their wings oh, actually right. shakes, shakes the it pollen off. out and, and makes it more readily available to whoever the uh, pollinator is. And I thought that was kind of interesting. It's, mm -hmm. it's one of those over time where plants have adapted to the pollinators and pollinators back to sure. the plant itself. Right, right. Yeah. You know, and then certain, you know, certain plants attract certain insects. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you're not going to have one flower that's going to attract every type of bee that right. there actually is mm -hmm. or one that's going to attract every type of a butterfly. Right. You know, so there's, you know, different native species of, you know, say like milkweed mm -hmm. um, that you will know, attract certain certain butterflies to certain areas. So it's it's kind of this balance that you need to do of having the certain mix of flowers to attract the certain types of, of you know, butterflies or pollinators in order to get that overall mix. Right, right. And sometimes they're so specific that their habitat gets wiped out and then you wipe out the insects because right. there's that symbiotic relationship and it's like it's not there anymore. Right. And, and so, you know in the nursery, uh, people are coming in asking for milkweed now. Mm -hmm. And there are now various types of milkweed across the country. And a lot of times you need to find the milkweed for your area so that that plant right. will produce as well. And we talked about the, we visited the Oregon Zoo here, yes. and they do the silver spot, which um, they, the silver spot feeds on one particular type of violet, That's I right. believe. Violet, and, yeah. and so, you know, they eat the leaves, and it's like the monarch. Is it, are we focusing too much on things like the monarch when we talk about stuff like that? Are we saying, you know, oh, the, you know, everybody's got to plant milkweed, got right. to plant milkweed, and now the monarch is listed as endangered as of just a... a okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, are we focusing too much, or we should? Is it good that people are saying, "Yeah, you know what? Let's save the monarch," but mm -hmm. shouldn't we be saving all pollinators? We should. I mean, yeah. you, monarchs are one of those. Or it's, it's you know, the you, poster child. I think. It, it is. <laughs> you know, it's it's one you hear hear a lot about. Mm -hmm. They are an important species, but it is like you, Jeff, to your point, is you know, it's a much wider wider range range than that. You know, each you know that monarch is after a you know, certain flower and pollinating certain things, but you know. The bee over here is going to pollinate a certain thing too, so it's mm -hmm. not it's not one size fits all right. as far as pollination pollinators go. Right, and I think too it goes back to being a good steward. You know, watching the pesticides. If you're going to use them, be responsible. Make sure that right. you're doing so much for your garden to be as natural as possible. Don't swat things. Don't you know if you don't like. Um, you know, caterpillars, make sure that you know which ones that are the disruptive ones, you know, and identify them. I mean, it's fun to do. I mean, like your bee pro, you know, paper right. here, I mean, all the different caterpillars, you can find all that information right. online. When we were talk talking earlier before we started, you were talking, you know, caterpillars, you, you need your caterpillars because your caterpillar <laughs> is what turns into your moth and your butterfly. Right, right. Right, so it's, you know, it's when you start taking those out at the, at that larva stage and mm -hmm. preventing it from the first place, it's never going to evolve to be able to pollinate. Right, right. And even the state of Oregon, many years ago, they started um, putting out caterpillars for the tansy ragwort, mm -hmm. which is a horrible weed for livestock. Right. And so they would just um, put them out, and then they would destroy all of the, the tansy. 
and it was a natural predator for that right. weed. And then we'd have all these cinnabar moths everywhere, and it was so cool. Yeah. So I, I know that we were at a nursery, and we got to see that just that whole cycle, and it was just so cool to see that it's still out and about. Right. You know, so we get kind of caught up in our yards that we want everything to be kind of perfect, mm -hmm. right? We want it. We don't like little holes on our on our plants, or you know maybe little aphids or bugs on on the tips of our rows or whatever it is. But come to the end of the day, does it really matter? You know, are you? spraying a lot of things to control those things and why, mm -hmm. right? When if you have this symbiotic relationship between your pests and your plants and your pollinators, you know, they, need, they feed on these insects and they're pollinating with the flowers. So they're all kind of working together and we're kind of going in and, you know, interrupting that. Very much. Yeah. You had mentioned um, uh, using insecticides and uh, trying not to use pesticides on your, and you mentioned natural being natural and a lot of people will say but I use an organic spray I use yeah. an organic pesticide and mm -hmm. it, it really doesn't make a difference synthetic versus natural and organic yeah. right yeah the best thing to do is put out ladybugs you know or praying mantis or right. lace wings or you know that kind of a predator insect that would kind of help with the pest that you don't want versus a chemical, natural and organic or synthetic. So, you know, if you put out those kinds of things that can maybe, you know, help you take care of the pests you don't want. Right. And, uh, you know, if you're putting it on spraying, whatever you're spraying at the wrong time, yes. oh, you're going to, whether it's natural or organic, you don't want to spray when exactly. the pollinators are active on the, right. in the middle of a bloom cycle. Right. You want to either apply before or after, like when the fruit's there. And, and you know, once again, the label is the law. Right. Read yes. the instructions. Please so, watch, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, so we have native pollinators. We're talking about, you know, the uh, native bees. Mm -hmm. And then we have introduced pollinators. And so uh, specifically, we're talking about um, the European honeybee, which has come in. And there's a lot of problems now with the European honeybee with mites and, and that. Um, is there a preference? I mean, a lot of people are beekeepers. They bring in bees. They want the, is the native pollinators better? Or is it just that we can harvest from the European honeybee? Mm -hmm. well, I think, you know, anytime you're introducing something new to an ecosystem, you're opening yourself up for problems. Mm -hmm. You know, you know it's, Mother Nature has this plan and she's had it for, <laughs> for, for, for <laughs> sure. thousands of years without us, right, right. you know, getting getting involved in it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then you try to introduce something to think that you're going to fix one thing, but you might screw something else up mm -hmm. down down the road. And, you know, we kind of see that time and time again. Right. So it's it's a fine balance, it right, is. of when, when you're trying to introduce something new to to help, you know, you got to be careful with that because you can actually screw screw it up worse or screw something else right. up in the process. And for like mega farms, they, they can't depend on that. I mean, they have to produce X amount per yield, per acre. Right. So they have to rely on the honeybee to come in. You know, and there's companies that come and they'll bring the hives. Like, you know, the I've seen it on, just online for the almond growers. They have to bring them in. And those, then those bees are really overworked. But right. um, And you, we even see it here in the valley that there's hives. Um, so I think that it you have to bring it in, it's economics for the farmer. Well, and we were just talking too, um, we go out, and native bees, you know, there's a preference for native plants, mm -hmm. and so, but we've never seen a bee say, oh, no, that's, <laughs> that's not for me. This new cultivar of this neighbor, I can't be on this one, it's, you know, I gotta be on I, You know, and they do prefer, but it's, uh, they will pollinate, you bring in a pollinator, they will pollinate. Right. Um, and you know, we talked about smell, but um, I was reading that they, they also uh, can see ultraviolet light. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they can see uh, the flowers sending out the signals uh, that we can't always see in our wavelength of light. So yeah. yeah, if you ever see some of the pictures on it, it looks like landing patterns. That it's drawing the it, drawing that insect right to the center yeah. of the flower. Interesting. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. We're going to take a break now and hear from uh, Capital Subaru. And when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about more about pollinators, but we'll also talk about plants that you can use to attract those pollinators and why it's important to pick the plants that are correct for your area. We'll be right back.
start your new Subaru story at Capital Subaru. We are like nothing else. From the moment you step through these doors, you see it, you feel it. We do things differently here. Our people, our culture, our customer experience. Tell us what you're looking for and we'll upgrade the way you shop for Subarus. When you're just browsing, need great service, or starting your next adventure, we're always here for you. It's your story at Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. Join Garden Time as we hit the road again. In September of 2022, we'll travel to Holland and Belgium. We'll visit the world famous Allsmere Flower Auction, Flora World, the University Gardens of Ghent, and the Japanese Gardens of The Hague. We'll also visit the once a decade Floriot Expo, the World's Fair of Gardening. Enjoy the sights, sounds, and tastes of Ghent, The Hague, and Amsterdam on this wonderful tour. Go to Garden Time Tours for more information, and we'll see you in Europe. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, we're talking about pollinators today, and we talked about what is a pollinator and, uh, in the first part of the show. Now we're going to talk about how we can help, how we can bring pollinators in, and not just about plants, but how can we help right. attract pollinators? Well, I know we were looking on the Xerces Society website, and I think they've kind of brought it down to four steps. And so um, Ryan's got it pulled up right here, so if you can go through Yeah, that. so the, you know, the first step is basically grow pollinator-friendly plants. You know, put these plants in your in your yard that you're attracting the pollinators to to your yard. Uh, the next step would be provide you know somewhere a nesting place. You know, they they need to live somewhere. You want to bring them in the yard and then provide for them while they're there. And then the third step we've touched on a little bit would be avoid pesticides. Um, so we want to protect our protect them when once they're here. And then the fourth step they talk about you know spread the word. You know, kind of like we're doing with this and talk right. about the importance of it and why we need this and letting everybody know that it's, you know, it takes all of us. It's not just your individual yard. Right. And it's not that hard to do. And it's flowers that we all love. I mean, it's not like you're putting in things that you're right. not going to like and it's like, oh, I don't like that one. But it's like in every, almost everything flowers except um, conifers, you know. So really, you're going to get a beautiful garden. Yeah. And I think, too, you have to remember to put in things seasonally. So you want things that are going to be blooming you know, as soon as the weather turns nice, even like rosemary, it's blooming in February, January, right. hellebores blooming early. So you need to have something like every few weeks, you know, something's going to be taking on right. and supporting those pollinators right. in your garden. Right, because it's easy to think, okay, I'm, I'm going to buy this one plant and at the garden center, it's a, it's a pollinator, you know, right. it's, a, it's tag pollinator, I'm going to plant that one plant. But, you know, it's only blooming for, you know, four, six weeks, maybe eight weeks, and then it's done. So you want, if you're trying to get pollinators in your yard, you want them to stick stick around. So, because they need to go somewhere where they they have something to eat, right? right? So they're just going to move move on once you're there. So it's you know, we're talking about the importance of building kind of this all season, you know, pollinator garden. Is and so you know, it was a good time. You know, we're always evaluating our garden of what's blooming at certain times of year to make sure those you have a pollinator in there. Right, right. And there's so many lists out there. The Xerces Society has them. Um, there's so many out there. Go to your independent garden center. Go there every couple weeks because you'll see what's blooming. Right. I mean, that's your telltale right there. I mean, if it's blooming in the garden center, it's going to be blooming right. in your yard, give or take a week or two. Right. And, you know, and it's, you know, we also look at, you know, a lot of regionality, you know, mm -hmm. throughout, you know, we're here sure. in, the, in the Pacific Northwest, but you know, you can create this anywhere across the United States for whatever region you're in. You know, you're going to have natives to your region. You're going to have, you know, native bars, which we'll, we'll t touch on a little right. bit what that is. Um, but, you, you know, there are annuals and perennials and trees and shrubs that are native to your area that will get you multi-bloom bloom cycles throughout the season. And we had yeah. talked earlier about uh, the monarch butterfly and, and planting milkweed. And it's more than just looking for one species. You're looking to create that variety and not just for spring. Everybody's yeah. always right. excited about spring color and spring blooms. It's always about, like you said, and creating that variety. And we talked with, I think it was Rosie from n, &N mm -hmm. Nursery, and she's a, a grower and retailer. And she's saying, come into the garden center every couple of weeks and see right. what's blooming because 
that's what's going to be attracting those those pollinators. Yeah. Native okay. and other ones. Yeah, but right. she has trained hummingbirds at her place. I mean, she's got those <laughs> hummingbird buffet planters. Right. I mean, she is catering to them, and they're everywhere. It's like it's just so funny that it's like, well, they must work because here's the hummingbirds. Right. <laughs> yeah, we're getting dive bombed. It was right. really bad, so. But we also talked about mixing it up, you know, yes, because yes. you have the salvias that are you know attracting your your hummingbirds, right, but right. you know you need something for your bees and something for your butterflies right, and right. something that's blooming in, like you said, in February and something is blooming in April and something right. is blooming in June or whatever it is. So it's right. it's having a multi approach, which right. there's nothing wrong with having a whole bunch of different flowering things in your yard. Well, I, I like that, yeah, right? Yeah. So are flies, are flies pollinators because there's one that's buzzing you guys yeah. right now. So. And sure enough, they are. <laughs> Maybe for carnivorous plants. <laughs> Um, so uh, when we're talking about uh, seasonality, we're not just talking about flowering plants, too. We're talking about creating habitat. You had talked about giving them a place. And right. a lot of times these plants not only provide you know, the nectar and the pollen for these pollinators, they provide um, you know, some kind of uh, shelter, too, as well. So, I mean, foliage plants are important. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I think that you need all of that. And it's like definitely the foliage of caterpillars, of butterflies that you want to attract, you have to have the host plant for the caterpillars. So you have to have the plant that the caterpillars are going to eat so that they turn into the butterflies so that you have the beautiful right. butterflies. So that means that you're going to have plants getting chomped on. And, you know, it might look, you might go get squeamish, you know, but it's like, then you'll have that whole cycle. And so I think that's really interesting to have too. Right. And in, in the nesting sites, you know, you know, the, the bees need somewhere, mm -hmm. somewhere to live and host, you know, be it in, you know, the little tubes in a, in a bee house or, you know, in the ground, right. you know, you'll have, mm -hmm. you know, in the ground or up so in your eaves right. or wherever mm -hmm. they're going to build their nest, that they need this habitat for it. You know, not only do they need to, you know, pollinate the flowers and eat, but they also need, they need a water source, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's, you know, we kind of forget about that where you, you know, you have your bird bath and you go out there and it's, you know, covered in bees. Well, those bees are thirsty, right? <laughs> I mean, the, the yeah. birds need the water, the bees need the water, you right. know, we need the water. So it's having, making sure you have this overall habitat and ecosystem in your, in your yard that has, you know, something for them to eat, some place for them to stay and, and the water and the mm -hmm. shelter. Yeah. Um, so we also talked about, you just started talking about the types of plants that you plant and we're talking about you know the cultivars which are you know the new ones that come out every year um, and then we talked about natives and native ours and what's the differences between all those so native plants are the ones that when you go hiking i think that's maybe an easy way to say right. they're going to be out in the woods you're at a national park at state park your natural area in there and so that's what you're going to see so that's native um and that can go I get more complex from there, but right. I think that's the easiest way to say. Right. What, so, what, what is naturally, naturally occurring, yeah, right, right, and has right. been been grown and uh, without somebody disturbing or planting Correct. it there, right. Mother Nature's just kind of taken over and done right. her thing. Right. Versus native ours. <laughs> right. So like a native R would be an example like, you know, Oregon grape here in the Northwest is a, is a native plant for us, you know, Mahoney aquafolium. And then you get into some different varieties of that they've taken and bred over the years to make them either smaller leaf or more compact grow or a different bloom like you know mahonia what soft caress mm -hmm. would be an example of that you know they've made it look look prettier than a native native plant and that smaller, that. Yeah. so then it comes down to now is that technically considered a native or a native var and another pollinator is going to come to it right. as well it's the same flowers right. It's the same flower, it blooms at the same time. I mean, they bloom like in winter time, which is great for, you know, insects or right. um, different kind of, you know, birds or whatever, like the hummingbirds that are here. It's great for our hummingbird that stays all winter. I mean, they love those mahonias, um, but it's not technically a natives. And some people are just like strictly native, right. you know, gardeners. And so they get very particular. It's right. like, no, I don't want that. So when it comes down to pollinators, you know, I don't think that butterfly really is going to matter. Ooh, yeah. sorry, that, that's not the, not the right one. I'm not going to go to that one. It's right. messing up my mojo. Right. You know, and then uh, ribes would be, was another mm -hmm. one we were talking about, you know, ribes sanguinium, the, you know, the flowering current, you know, another native for us here, but, you know, you have King Edward and, mm -hmm. you know, white icicle and, you know, some, we've bred some different coloring into them. You know, you have a lot of the characteristics and the same flower structures and pollen counts. It's all going to be okay. Right. And that's what they're looking, like you said, that's what they're looking for. They're just looking for their next meal. 
right. and then they're going to be pollinating <laughs> as right. a side. Right. And then, you know, we were talking about cultivars too, and so a cultivar is just a plant that's been produced a lot of times by a plantsman or a plantswoman, right. mm-hmm. where they've just taken pollen and they just crossbreed. It's like roses, you know, you start out with the very beginning roses, and then you now they made you know, grandifloras, and there's, you know, all kinds of different types of roses, and that was all through cross-pollination, Right. a lot of times by hand, mm-hmm. or a lot of times they find the new plant in the wild, oh, and, sure. and they go out and get it. So, um, do pollinators, I mentioned, asked this before, do you think they care at all? Um, I mean, you said they don't, I mean, and I don't see, I, I see a lot of uh, hoverflies, I see around with the European honeybee and they're just, they see a bloom, they have the nectar, they see the pollen, they're just going for it. Well, I know there's a lot of research that they're doing at our Oregon State University about that. If the pollinators are going after the cultivated varieties. Um, And I think it goes back to our whole environment because if that one plant, that one native plant, only attracts that one native pollinator, they don't want to lose it. They don't want to lose either one. So I think that's the research, too, Mm -hmm. that they want to make sure that we're kind of using all of those. Right. So it goes back to that we have to kind of look at the big picture, too. I I think that's something to see. You know, and I think there's a little something something for everyone. You know, there's going to be people that are very much, you know, has to be this native variety. I have to plant this to attract this this native thing. Great. Mm-hmm. You know, if that's the route you want to take, we're strictly strictly native. But you know, there's a lot of us that, you know, we're okay with planting planting a, a native R or mm-hmm. a cultivated variety because we're still trying to do do the same thing. You know, we're all on the same page of trying making sure that we have pollinators coming to our garden. You know, to poll- pollinate the the plants and the fruits and the and the vegetables, and you know, creating this ecosystem. So, you know, I don't know if there's necessarily right or wrong. Exactly. Right. Yeah. We're all all working on it together and make, making awareness right. of it. And so I now think- that you talk about that variety. You guys have uh, we had a, a list on the Garden Time website, GardenTime.tv, and it was a the year uh, like seasonal, a seasonal. Mm-hmm. perennial garden. Right. And we started with the spring and went to the summer and into fall, and you had tall medium and short varieties of flowers and we had that chart and we started talking about um, creating a pollinator list and Ryan you sat down in your magic fingers <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. none of these are not necessarily natives mm-hmm. but they are still pollinator attractants mm-hmm. yeah right so you know I started looking at it it's like okay I just broke down some you know quickly some perennial perennial varieties and, and then some adding in some seasonal annuals that would give you kind of a longer longer bloom time but you know you know things like you know some of the early spring you know yarrow mm-hmm. is a is a great perennial widely adaptable across the united states in a, in a very various forms for multi different climates so and you know another one that's been cultivated so there's mm-hmm. lots of different colors and shapes right, right. and sizes but you know yarrows do well that's the act um, Columbine, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, it's another one of those that's very well adapted across the across the United States in some some form. Um, but it's a, a great early spring, right. and spring. native in so many places across the United States. Yes, mm-hmm. right. So and, many, yeah. And then um, you know, Campanulas, you know, Coreopsis um, is another one. You know, Delphiniums. You know, we see a lot a lot of those in the early spring. Um, you know, Dianthus does great. Foxglove is another one you'll see see a lot of and you all all very very early spring bloomers and you know I think on your list what I like too, it I think it appeals to so many different kind of gardeners because mm-hmm. so many different you know people they love their garden to just experience and you know like they just love to be out there right. but then there's some people that love to bring flowers in for bouquets yes and so a lot of those for spring you know you plant a couple of them so that you leave one in the garden and you bring another one indoors right and so I think that we all have to think about how what do we want from our garden? You know, do you want to just be able to have it as your sanctuary, or do you want to use it or share or whatever? So that's what I love about this list that it's it's color, but right. and it's pollinator friendly. Right, and it, it's and, mul- right, it's mul- multi uses. Yes, right. And we can remember too that these here are plants that you pulled that are going to do fairly well pretty much throughout the United mm-hmm. States. Right, but yeah. always check with your local garden Definitely. center. Or, or plant grower to see what's going to work in your area. And I noticed you had some summer 
Yeah, yeah, you know, some of, some of the summer ones, you all love the agastaches, mm -hmm. you know, are, are great for that. You know, we talked about the milkweeds, the asclepsias, mm -hmm. um, lots of different varieties, you know, you know, for wherever you are yeah. in, in the U.S., you'll, you'll find a variety of milkweed that's na native to your mm -hmm. area. But there, um, Budleias, mm -hmm. you know, Budleias kind of got a bad rap there for a number of years as being on noxious weed lists mm -hmm. yeah. and invasive because they were re reseeding, yeah. you know, the breeding that's going in, into them now. They're, they're the more sterile varieties, mm -hmm. but, you know, you're still attracting ton, tons of the butterflies, mm -hmm. much smaller growth habits. Yeah. So there's some really cool... Right. Budley is out there, you know, dahlias, echinaceas, you know, your cone, cone flowers. Yeah, talk about native. Right, yeah. Na native ones, and yeah. the color range that you can get oh, no, it's on amazing. the on those is yeah. just, you know, amazing. And new ones coming out every year. Oh there God. are lots of 20. new ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Every, every shade of orange and red and yellow <laughs> and pink and purple and green and bicolor now and doubles and oh, single it's that's, crazy. It's it is crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. Um, Gallardia. Another one, the blanket flower, yeah, those is colors. another one. You know that real bright kind of oranges and reds Beautiful. and yellows, yeah. which is and lavender. No, yeah, right. And you can use lavender so many different ways. Right, so lavender is just it, people have you know, orders of it, it right? Yeah. 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 So yeah. multi-use, yeah. multi-colors and flavors. So those those are great. But those are perennials that are going to come back year right. after mm -hmm. year in the garden. Right. So right. you want to make sure that you place them in places where you want them to come right. back. Right, right, right. I mean, you even get get plants, you know, like Minarda, which is called. Bee balm, right? You know, so it's got, yeah, it's got a pollen. A good, good hint right there. That might be something good to be plant, planting in. But then there are also annuals too that uh, you put in. And you use those to fill in. Is right. So, so a lot of times, you know, your your perennials are not usually one that's going to bloom all year long. Mm -hmm. So perennials have a they'll have a four, six, eight week kind of bloom time, and that's why it's nice to have you know early spring ones, mid spring ones, late spring or summer ones to kind of stagger your bloom times right. and then your annuals are going to be the ones that you're going to be replanting mm -hmm. every year but it's going to give you that much longer bloom time it's right. going to start you know right at right early early spring and it will go a lot of times until till frost, frost in, yeah. in the fall yeah. so it gives you that color and that's where you're going to fill in you know into your containers or hanging baskets spots in your yard where you may have barrier is just that splash of color right but, you know there's some there's some great um, pollinator annuals mm -hmm. that, oh, sure. that do well, well there too. So, and then also um, before we go on um, herbs, we were talking about yes. Mm -hmm. And so why not put herbs in there? Those are great pollinators. Right. You know, you talked about the rosemaries, mm -hmm. and you know even you know your sage and, and your thymes. Mm -hmm. They're all Oregano's, very yep. right, flowering and attracting attracting those beneficials to right. your to your garden. And they're pretty too. There <laughs> and, and useful. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And then um, even going into late summer. You know, we go into our Rebecca's, the tall flocks, um, sedums. Those are all perennials that are just still going to be really great for them, too. And, we, you know, a lot of people, too, are finding these wildflower mixes. And uh, mm. we um, came up against this. So, uh, Capital Subaru is the sponsor of the TV show for many years. And we did Capital uh, Subaru Garden Days. And they give away seeds, and they wanted to give away a wildflower mix. And so we were looking around and there are wildflower mixes that are commercially available. You send in, you know, contact them, and they send you the seed. That's not necessarily the best, is it? Because those mixes aren't the same. No, not at all. You have to really be careful for your area, and also you have to look at varieties, because sometimes the varieties are scary. They're aggressive. They're thugs, and they'll just kind of take over. Right. And you're, you know, you're starting problems that way. So you really have to look at those mixes. Right. Yeah, and we did that. We uh, actually contacted a local brewer here in the state mm -hmm. of Oregon that provided a wildflower mix that provided wildflowers for our <laughs> natives and regular pollinators right. here. So, um, and that all goes into design. So um, when you're thinking about design, once again, we go back to that whole variety thing. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, and, you know, we talked about, you know, we just talked, kind of touched on annuals and perennials, but. You get into your, your flowering trees, mm -hmm. you know, your flowering shrubs, you know, that are that you can incorporate along with it. So you have, you know, kind of a full a full garden approach, mm -hmm. you know, of annuals, perennials, trees, shrubs, you know, vines and Definitely. herbs and vegetables and it's mm -hmm. you know, they're all the symbiotic working together, season long colors. So there's a lot that you can do. Yeah, and it's like monocultures are really not a good thing. And we were at Stoller Family Estate and they that's a monoculture, it's a winery. Right. And so they were putting in that pollinator garden. And it was like, how smart. Right. Because they wanted to have a diverse collection. 
So, I mean, that's something to think about for our own gardens. I remember, too, they had a walk, so you could mm-hmm. grab a glass of wine and yeah. do the pollinator walk. Right. And it wasn't just flowering plants. They had grasses yeah. underneath that oak tree, which it was fast. Right, you're right. They, were, they decided not to keep their kind of their meadow mode anymore mm-hmm. to make it uniform. They were letting the native grasses and the native flowers kind of come up to be not manicured and let there be pollinators, mm-hmm. you know, and it was, you know, beneficial, A, to the big trees that were around also, because you weren't getting the compaction. It was shading the roots of the trees. Mm-hmm. You know, it was providing habitat, habitat for other, right. you know, other insects and animals in the taller grasses. So, you know, when you have areas like that, it's coming back to, you mm-hmm. know, this full circle ecosystem. Yeah. And it's so nice to hear when you, you know, they're a winery. Mm-hmm. Why should they care? But they want to have a really beautiful place for their clients, but they want to be part of that um, ecosystem, you know, and kind of just, you know, work with it. And it's like, it's wonderful, and it just benefits everybody. Yeah, and, you know, that's, you know, as we look at our own gardens, you know, know, maybe a lot of us don't have fruit trees in our our own garden, or we don't have a vegetable patch, and we're maybe not worried about pollinators because they're not affecting us for what we're growing Mm -hmm. in our yard. Mm -hmm. But we need to think, larger and more globally about attracting the, the beneficials to our area, mm-hmm. right? And making sure that there there's habitats for them, even though it's not pollin- pollinating that plant in our yard right. for, for fruit production, right. but the local farmer down the street that relies on that or your other neighbor or you know, just the area in general, it's good to remember that. It is so true because, you know, there is so much construction and habitat is being kind of compromised. Right. So if you can have a little oasis in your backyard, you're really, you're helping. And we all, yeah. I think we kind of feel impotent sometimes that I want to help. How can I help? And right. this is how we can help. Right. Well, we ended up a couple of years ago, we went down to Oregon State University and we talked to extension agents there. And, mm-hmm. and uh, there was one gentleman there, Anthony. Anthony, yeah. Yeah, and he... Um, was an extension agent that was dealing in pollinators and was that was his area of expertise and um, they came out with enhancing urban and suburban landscapes to protect pollinators and it was a, a large brochure I'll have links to it on our website um, but it's it was fascinating because it wasn't just about picking plants and cultivars and natives um, there's also a video involved in that too which you can see they were talking too about creating the, the overall habitat mm-hmm. So right. providing nesting spaces and like we were talking about foliage plants that, you know, that benefit the caterpillars and not just, you know, the bees. And right. they were looking at the overall um, scope of attracting and keeping pollinators alive and thriving in your garden. So, um, but that's all part of the design process. So when you're designing, obviously you're looking at all those things. Right. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot of information that we've we've gone over yeah. over today in this, but it's, you know, the important thing is to remember there there's a lot of a lot of this that's e- easy to find online. You know, mm-hmm. with the, you know, your local, you know, ag- you know, extension agency through your we we'll call it, you know, the Xerce Society, or even going to your local garden center. You know, there's there's so much more um, information out there now. You know, and a lot of growers now are looking at at plants and what is a pollinator. And they're incorporating that in their tag. Yeah. So you know you can go go into the garden center and find hey, it will say pollinator mm-hmm. on on this plant. You know and ask ask your garden center you know salesperson that will help you build out a, a program. So it's it, it sounds like it could be daunting to put this oh, together, right, but there's right. there's a lot of you know very easy information out there that can kind of follow and a lot of help right. that to get you to where you need to be. You know, just a few years ago, it wasn't even a buzzword because we all knew that happened. But it got, kind of got lost in translation with new gardeners or whatever. Right. And so now we have to hone in on it. Mm-hmm. We have to say, this is a pollinator plant. But really, they're all do something. Yeah, and right. I think that we forget that. But it's good to identify it. It's good that it's become you know a topic of conversation right. that, that it's out there. It's that buzzword. Yeah. Well, you know? we talk about the three Bs, birds, bees, and butterflies. Mm-hmm. And it goes much further than right. that. And a lot of people feel overwhelmed. What would you give? I mean, you were saying you, know, you want to do something. Want to feel like you're doing something? What uh, advice would you give to um, gardeners to get started? Oh, just plant something. You know, just plant yeah. a few couple plants, and you know, maybe one for every month of the summer, or from late spring to fall. Right. You know, nobody, nobody's no asking you to tear, go tear out your yard no, and, and re, redo it. You know, there's you can definitely just add to it. Right. You know, a little at a time. You know, right. plant a plant or two. You know, a lot of us are on 
plant budgets too. You right. Know, as right. It gets yeah. added. But you know, you can you can add add two things, right? right? And so you're adding a plant here, and it's like, okay, that's out of bloom, and I'm missing something in my yard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Add, add a little something else, sure. and you know, go like we talked about, go visit your garden center every so often just to get ideas. Or start in a what, small area and, right. and don't right. stress out about the right. overall. Right. Right. Just start in small, right. or maybe even just a few containers on your deck. Because right. some right. people don't have gardens. I mean, if you're right. on a patio or you have a lanai or a balcony, and maybe you just put a, a hanging basket or a container, but just be cognizant that you want something to attract. Um, some kind of a, a good insect to kind of come right. and pollinate it. Yep. Great. Well, um, I, what pretty much wraps us up for today, um, obviously we're going to have all yeah. those links on the gardentime.tv <laughs> website. Yes, yeah. uh, we invite you to send questions in, um, and we also ask you to share the links to the video, the links to the podcast, um, you know, let people know that we're here, um, and send us topics if you want us to... Yeah. Uh, if you, you have agree, questions or topics, yeah, we're, we're open to talk. So. If you agree with us or disagree <laughs> with us, you know, well, um, we, we welcome that because we're all adults here. So um, anyway, uh, we thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time, and happy gardening. Start your new Subaru story at Capital Subaru. We are like nothing else. From the moment you step through these doors, you see it, you feel it. We do things differently here. Our people, our culture, our customer experience. Tell us what you're looking for and we'll upgrade the way you shop for Subarus. When you're just browsing, need great service, or starting your next adventure, we're always here for you. It's your story at Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway.